why is he screaming in a park <laughs> run? This guy's <laughs> weird. Hello. Harry here. John Cosgrove spent much of his 20s touring in a punk rock band. And then, just a few years ago, John discovered an ability to run. I was a bit like, whoa, I've won a race. In this eye-opening conversation, we talked about his life so far and what made him turn to running. I think that's a really, 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 really good way of explaining it, Harry, I have to say. We also had some heavier moments during this conversation. Whereas I was the extroverted one, I think she wants to be, me to be more like... Uh... John is a good friend and a unique, warm person. If you enjoy this conversation, you can check out other episodes on the Jog On podcast. You can also visit our website, thisisjogon.com, to discover the training plans, running kit, and much more about the world of Jog On. So please, welcome to the show, John Cosgrove. I grew up uh, not far uh, from here, really. I grew up in Lys, a lovely little sleepy East Hampshire hamlet, Harry. Have you spent much time away from there? You've travelled a lot, but you now are based quite close to there. Are you a person who likes to be at their roots? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I live in Petersfield, which isn't too far from Lys. Well, it's four miles away. Petersfield feels and has always felt like home. When you're young and at school, was, was sport ever a part of your life and, and, and exercise and running? I know you played a bit of cricket early mm. on. What was it like in terms of activities? Were you playing music early? Were you doing sport early? At school, I played cricket. That's sort of the one sport I did like. I was quite... Well, how can I describe myself at school? Not not sporty, not athletic, really. I hated running. I got a lift from one of my friend's mums in a cross country once uh, in a, I think it was a luminous yellow Mondeo, if I'm correct, um, because I didn't like running. I always thought running was stupid when I was a kid. I always thought it was for people who are late. Um, yeah. It didn't look it didn't look fun to me. So a bit of cricket at school, and that was it really. Um, and no music really either until I was about fifteen. Oh, okay, didn't start playing music. I was just trying to please my parents by going to uh, I went to private school as well don't hate me people um, and I was probably trying to please my parents by doing well at school rather than doing what I wanted to do which was music and probably more sport Oh, interesting. Were you a batsman, bowler, fielder? What was your sort of strength? In well, cricket? my cricket mates would probably say, Harry, that I was best at uh, driving people to the ground or umpiring. <laughs> um, so that is an all-rounder, of course. I would say I'm probably more of a bowler. Yeah, yeah. Bowl a bit of spin. Well, your, your cricket, we'll talk about it later on, how yeah. cricket kind of became a... a bigger part of your life you pick it up later on and even do some charitable work through it mm. then let's talk about the music because that becomes such a part big part of your life around 15 what is it you're interested in you're interested in singing playing the guitar was there an attraction to the instrument did you listen to a lot of music yeah i suppose even from a young age my dad was in bands my dad's irish and he was part of like the 60s kind of rock scene like Thin Lizzy and stuff like that in Ireland so I had that music rock and roll kind of heritage when I was growing up but I got into punk rock and rock quite early from like 10 11 years old so I was always fascinated by bands and just being on stage because I'm a natural extrovert like yourself <laughs> <laughs> as we've talked about on uh, a few runs um, yeah not not a quiet run yeah I just always kind of liked music it was it just felt natural to me and to be i always wanted to be up on a stage showing off and playing songs and music seemed like uh, the perfect way to do that and when does it really start to pick up to the point where you're joining bands were you in like school bands and stuff how did it begin that you actually started playing and even doing a bit of touring i started playing in bands when i was at college so i'd literally only been playing guitar a couple of years and then straight away started playing in bands because i just wanted to be on stage showing off so i must have been 16 17 and then started probably touring in my mid 20s something like that got more into punk rock bands we set up playing in a band called pickle dick 2000 and i'd say probably our first tour and Don Marsinger has got a much better memory than me. I'd say probably about 2003, 2004 yeah, yeah. would be our first ever tours. So that's what, that's nearly 20 years ago now, which is crazy. And that, I mean, that means obviously me being 30, I was only 10 going on tour, right? <laughs> 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 10 driving around in a Vauxhall Nova around the country, you know. It must have been 2003, 2004, we started doing that kind of touring nationwide and like building, building a name for ourselves. As much of a name for a band called Pickle Dick as you can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what, what was that life like? I mean, it, does it have some tough elements? Are you sort of, is it like life on the road the way we picture it in films, like sort of surrounded by guitars, back of the van, on to the next gig, not much money? Like, what was it like? Was it a struggle? Was it just pure in ecstasy enjoyment? What was that life like? 
I suppose it also being mid mid twenties and still really feeling like trying to work my way out in life and like formative years of my life and everything like that mm. we weren't ever going to be massive at the time. We probably had uh, delusions of grandeur, but for me, like driving around the country in a Vauxhall Nova, we only did that for a year, by the way. Okay. And then, then we got a van. It was like being in an adventure with your mates and then playing a show in the evening and like yeah, it was it was really exciting, but. Yeah, there wasn't like lots of money and stuff like that. It was pretty. We tried to not party too hard on tour so we could actually play the next night, but that wasn't always possible. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you mentioned de- delusions of grandeur, which is going to be one of my questions. What were the dreams and the aspirations of the band? Were you quite an ambitious band? Would, did it depend on the member? Were some like, well, guys, you know, we'll get to this level, or or were there some of you that thought we really want to keep pushing this? What did you hope to do with it? Well, Dom, who I've mentioned uh, previously, is the singer and the songwriter. And Dom is like one of the most talented songwriters I think I I know or met. He's so good at writing just catchy pop punk songs. I felt that we could probably do quite well through his songwriting skills because he's great at writing songs. I think we both wanted to do well and do do the best we could. But maybe we didn't have the maybe the human skills to kind of the other side of it to push ourselves through. It must be such a formative part. You you must look back on it with a sense of fondness. Oh, totally. I mean, we got to do so many great things. We, uh, we changed our name 2007 to Mike TV. And then we went around China twice. We went around all, all around Europe. What was the reason for the name change? Um, I, just, I think we went, as you say, the delusions of grandeur, probably trying to do a bit better than uh, we were doing and trying to kind of expand the band because we just spent a lot of money and a lot of time recording an album. Mm. And it probably didn't sound quite like Pickled Dick, like a scrappy kind of sort of early Green Desk pop punk band. It was really well produced. So we thought we'd change the name. We were going to spend some money promoting it, but we spent that all going to China and going on a tour for a month. Wow. So which was an amazing experience. And then we did the same the year afterwards. So we kind of had those kind of like um, aspirations to like be a bigger band and mm. stuff. But whenever I see bands now or hear bands or see young bands, I'm just like, honestly, just live every day. Don't worry about becoming like the world's biggest band or anything. Just because just enjoy it because it's all relative. Like whether you're playing to 20 people or you're playing in someone's living room or, or you're playing a, a massive thing, you're still out there playing music and living that kind of creative music life. I know that you're still doing music and you have, and you could make the argument that it never really has ended. So I don't know that my question is, when did it end? It's more just, when did it wind down and why for you? Um, 2015 was the last time we played as a full band. Dom Ossinger, um, he won't mind me saying, he's had quite a few mental health problems. I don't think he was keen to carry on doing band stuff then. Yeah, I suppose we all got to a certain age. We were reaching mid-30s by then and just do some different stuff. We've played some acoustic gigs since, Dom and I. The spelling of his name is with a B on the end. Is yeah. that a stylized thing or has he got that by Depot? <laughs> yeah, we changed it because Dom, dumb. Dumb Dom is just punk rock, you know. Those young punks, those young whippersnapper <laughs> punks. It's the cool thing to do. Yeah, like J-Hon, isn't it? It's like the H for the O in my name, just trying to be edgy and cool. Didn't succeed. Interesting, just on the on the subject of the family, how did your family slash parents react to this band lifestyle? Because it's <laughs> definitely a bit of a you know, private school background. It's a bit of a bit of a curveball to be like, I'm off touring China yeah. uh, with a band. Did they understand? I mean, your dad has the musical connections. So did, did they understand the passion for it? Yeah, that's a really good question, Harry. I think I, I think they did. I think they probably would have liked it if I'd been a bit more academic and done a bit better at school because I was always, as a kid, I was quite smart and bright and academic and then obviously went to private school and then I probably kind of balanced out a bit there. I was like, oh, there's all these other kids. And I went a year earlier, so there's all these other kids. And they're all a bit smarter than me. I think they probably wanted me to be a bit more academic and to go down that route, but... I went down uh, the the punk the route of punk rock. They were always very supportive. Mum was always very supportive. Like we used to practice sometimes in the house. The house was full of like amps and stuff like that. We used to get drunk and stick stickers all around the house to make my parents find them and stuff like that. So that was kind of a fun but kind of weird game on reflection. <laughs> um, but hey, it was, it was my journey. If it hadn't been for music, do you know what it would have been? Was there a standout subject that you always thought, oh, I might have become a lawyer or something? Or <laughs> did, did music kind of, maybe cloud is a bit of a negative word, but was, was music just so obvious that it blocked any other sight of a different future? I, that's, a re- again, a really good question. I mean, this feels very therapeutic, this, uh, <laughs> <It's a counseling laughs> this chat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, these are really, really good questions, Harry, really good. Um, 
And the answer is no, there was nothing. I remember when I was younger, I always wanted to be a cricket commentator. Oh, I thought, wow. Do you know what? Sitting around like talking about cricket all day sounds awesome. I think I could do that. But then, uh, or a journalist. But that was when I was about 16. And before I started being a bit of a party boy, I was lucky when social media became a thing like like when myspace became a thing i started doing it for like companies so i was an early adopter of social media so that kind of came along and i could use like my writing skills and like sitting on the internet all day just to earn earn a few pounds so i think social media came along at just the right time to fill that kind of career gap for me we are taking a bit of a time machine leap forward now but as the band winds down um we we get to sort of maybe late 2016 Mm. and running becomes a part of your life from someone as you said who certainly wasn't a runner at school played some cricket but didn't see running as something he necessarily could see himself doing in a few years what's the the trigger or the spark that starts you running one of my cricket mates we lived in like the same cottage he lived in the end bit and i swapped walking his dog for uh, he was a personal trainer for him doing some personal training so we did like a month of running then a month of like gym stuff I really loved the running straight away I was really unfit and felt awful whilst doing it but there was something about it at the end which I just really really loved that feeling when I'd finished running like even those first few runs I remember feeling whoa this is like I really enjoy this you know what I mean like there's something addictive here and I've probably got quite an addictive personality so I did a little bit of running just for only like two or three months and then overdid it and I didn't run for like six months, something like that, because I got, you know, every run at the start injures their knees because we have weak glutes or weak hips. But that's what inspired me to kind of start doing that. And I entered a 10K with work. I used to work up in Leeds, the Abbey Dash. Yeah. And I think I ran about 49 minutes for my first 10K. And I was like, oh, that's pretty good. I, I was going to say, did you that. acknowledge at the time, oh, hang on, off so little, yeah. I've just run so sub 50. Yeah, I was like, that's pretty cool. Just for my first 10K. Yeah, it felt pretty good, actually. And then just kind of had a few months off with that kind of injury thing and then played some more cricket and then just worked out that I actually quite like running. Um, so I started again 2017 ish, end of 2016, 2017, and then did a few more kind of races then. Yeah, like you say, I think it's a fair assessment that it does seem like you are the kind of person who gets their teeth stuck in something and then it's like, <laughs> that's what you think about. So that seems to have happened with running. So by the time we get a year later, 2017, 2018, are you running a lot, like multiple days a week kind of kind of running? I'm straight in straight in there, addictive personality. Like when I was in the band, I'd be like, right, I'm going to do this. We'll sort out this tour. I'll do this. I'm yeah. quite, I'll, like if I'm going to do something, I'll get into it. As you say, I've put a lot of effort into it. And I did. I started running loads and loads and loads. Got really, really into running. And yeah, went from just about scraping a 19 minute park run down to kind of low 17s like by the end of 2017 so it was like I was like whoa I'm actually quite good at this and uh, enjoying it as well I mean the way you say that there that the whoa I've kind of become good at this it was one of my questions was kind of like was there a particular moment where you look back was there a race or a certain PB you hit <laughs> where you turn around and went do you know for someone who was like a punk rocker had a cricket <laughs> background like you wouldn't uh, point to you on stage uh, you know in 2007 and say that guy's probably got a good park <laughs> run in him you know probably because no one knew what park run was back in 2007 <laughs> but do you recall turning around and thinking not only do I enjoy this I get endorphins at the end of the run but I've actually run a time that's pretty damn respectable within the club running scene yeah that kind of naivety around being a new runner is a beautiful thing yeah and I like I think anyone who's a new runner should embrace that naivety and not do any research for as long as possible just enjoy running and not think about any of like the stuff so that that naive phase is absolutely beautiful that first kind of year was amazing I think I won like a couple of local half marathons just like a really small one um won that I was a bit like whoa I won a race I hated every kind of running now I'm winning a running race what's going on here and then there was a half marathon in Portsmouth which I won like the coastal half marathon just before Christmas and it was just really weird that people were like messaging me about running and say oh wow you've won all these races and I remember telling Dom and Dom was like what how have you got? How have you started running and winning races? I have no idea, mate. I don't even know what's going on here. So it was, it was quite a nice kind of like, well, this is all very new and exciting. I mean, there's so many things to to mention in terms of then your your running journey and experience. But mm. you discover an ability. You discover the joy of the actual feeling of running. Mm. You've got a good body type for it. You're tall. You've got a great leg stride. Oh, I thanks, remember. Harry. I remember running. I know. <laughs> Stop it. It's becoming flirtatious. This I know. I'm loving this. I, w- yeah. I wouldn't tell you to jog on, young man. <laughs> the part that I'm interested in that I don't get to talk to many people about because you and I, you mentioned it earlier in our conversation, uh, which is the word extroversion, which um, society would look at us to in classes as what's known as extroverts. And <laughs> one of the things that I've realized as life has gone is actually 
um, how uncommon it can be to be a true extrovert where you really get uh, charged up off of meeting other people and meeting new people and having those interactions. And what I discovered um, during my career of running so far is that running has this incredible ability for people to meet each other. It brings in all sorts of crazy people. There's no one person you go, that's a runner, it, because anyone and everyone can if you've got two working legs. So you you must have been drawn to this thing where I'm going to these races and I'm shaking some hands and I'm meeting some people and having some of these conversations. That must have drawn you in as well, the interaction and the ability to meet new people. Yeah, totally. I met loads of people through running. I know we've lasted quite a few minutes without me telling you that I'm a vegan, so I've done quite well there. <laughs> immediately, well done. I know, it's unbelievable. Uh, immediately joined uh, Vegan Runners uh, UK and just met loads of people through that because you turn up in the vest and then you start chatting to other people, met loads of cool people through that, some of my best mates through the club. So that was great. Joined mm. my local club list and met people there. But it was just going to like park run and races and meeting with people. And I'm quite like, it was before a race, I'd have that natural like fizzy energy. Do you know what I mean? Before like playing a gig, like where he's just kind of building up. I'm just like, I just, I want to talk to everyone. I, I'd even find myself sometimes like be running a race and have that. Uh, like start screaming because I'm just enjoying it. Do you know what I mean? Like that kind of feeling of just like, whoa. Just yeah, yeah. Like, people are like, why is he screaming in a park <laughs> run? This guy is weird. <laughs> but I just was just had just that really nice kind of like feeling of just like I'm putting a lot of effort in here and feel like really connected to it. So do you ever feel or look back on the running and think how it might have filled a little bit of a void that was created by leaving the stage and performing? Yeah, no, you're totally right. I think that I wish I'd had running as well during being in a band because it would have had somewhere... Uh, I've got a lot of energy. Like, I've got so much energy. So I think that being in a band and maybe drinking too much and partying too much made that kind of anxiety fester in me. So when I started running, kind of was somewhere for that anxiety to go, all that energy. And I wish I'd kind of had that in the band. I think it would have been a much healthier thing. And that's why a part of a community called the Running Punks as well, which is like there's lots of musicians and lots of people that are into music. That kind of community is about that as well. Just, you know, getting people out who wouldn't normally run and getting them out running. And that was, I think that kind of helped me, just that thought of just channeling that kind of anxiety and fizzy energy. I think running absolutely i think i think running can be quite a cleansing experience people have talked about it it kind of almost you're rid of rid of stuff and uh, uh it's very powerful I, it, running punks was really interesting when i'd found out that you were part of it and i looked a bit more into the background of the club and exactly that it's almost like embracing the the craziness of the individuals who can run and people who might not think of themselves as runners can come along and it seems like they've got a really good um ethos uh, running punks and i know you've done bits and pieces and taken shoes down and done like shoe trials with them and stuff so it's your kind of main clubs have sort of been vegan running Runners and running punks are they the two of the big two yeah 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 so vegan runners is like the club that i run for that um ea whatever it's my first claim running club so they're they're my numero uno my local club lists uh, i'll run for them at some cross countries but i don't really do much of them running punks is more of a community that I'd, I'd say that i associate with you know like when people say it's like a tribe and you feel like part of something and it's so good that like running isn't just about traditional clubs anymore it's great for people that want to join that club and do the training do the track races and everything like that but some people don't want to go down that route they want to join a community and feel like they're part of something that's why something like running punks or any of the there's so many communities everywhere now like hey jog on have you heard of them they're yeah, great yeah it's just about getting those people to be a part of something and finding their tribe and what what works for them and meeting people and having that vibe to go out and meet people like park run at a race and motivate themselves to run and just yeah connect yeah, we're right at the heart of what Jog On is about, creating a community. The tagline, connecting people through a love of running and adventure, um, is a key part of it. And it's exactly that. It is kind of finding your tribe a little bit and being able to... Uh, the fact you talk about seeing someone else in a vegan vest, there's that immediate connection. There's there's a conversation, not that you or I really need conversation openers, but <laughs> if anyone does, seeing the vest is, is a great way. And one of my favourite photos I ever get is two people in a Jog On running vest at a park run who've just met and started talking out of nowhere. It sort of creates an extroversion that wasn't previously out there. It's, it's quite nice. Yeah, you're inspiring that conversation by having that kind of brand out there people like they do feel part of something so you're you're fostering that kind of communication through that which is great oh yeah i associate with that let's have a chat about running what, what, what do you do what how's your park run where are you going for breakfast all good 
I love that kind of stuff. And the, the strangers meeting is uh, something that randomly excites me. There's a couple of running experiences I want to pinpoint exactly. One of which is, um, I believe it was in 2018, you ran a marathon dressed as broccoli to raise some money. <laughs> yes. What What was that experience like, running <laughs> as broccoli? It still gets mentioned by people. I know. It's just, I suppose there's been many different aspects of my life. People remember me filming in a band or doing some hosting or doing like various stupid stuff that I've done throughout my life. But a lot of people remember me as broccoli man and all I did was like one like marathon dressed as a broccoli around Petersfield I do bring the broccoli out every boxing day now and call it broxing day I know it's, uh, it's unbelievably clever clever stuff oh. Uh, deep. Basically, I was going to India and I was trying to raise some money um, for Veganuary. So I did a marathon dressed as a broccoli. Yeah, it was really fun. It was like, it was all very silly and just like lots of people came out and joined and just, it was just highlighting that running's fun. My partner Pays is still annoyed with me because I got a Petersfield Sports Achievement Award for doing it. And she raised maybe about £80,000 for a, a kid's play park and didn't get anything. So, but now that we live together, I feel like I can share my awards with her because I'm yeah, that yeah. kind of guy. That's very kind of you. I know, it's unbelievable. 2018 culminates then you doing a 250-mile bike ride across India. Yeah. Um, that, that's phenomenal. But I want to take you in particular to a very special day in 2019, yeah. which is London Marathon. Mm. And from the way that I think you've written about it in blog posts, etc., it's clearly, it's it goes beyond just, oh, that was a really fun day. It's actually something that seems quite meaningful to you mm. and quite rightly. Um, a big factor being that you broke three hours, which I know for many runners is, is just a huge target can you even begin to tell me what the atmosphere was like that day what the experience of running london marathon was like oh it was amazing because i'd only done brighton marathon before and obviously i'd only been running like a couple of years and straight away i was like oh i want to do a sub free marathon like a lot of club runners do and i failed just failed by about five minutes at brighton and then the year after i was like london yeah let's go and do london and the it was amazing it was like I always say to people it was like running through like a computer game wow because just having people just cheering for you the whole time I'd only had 10 weeks to train for it but I trained well and just felt good you know like where you have one of those days where you just feel amazing mm. and the last 10k was my fastest and just everything felt really good I felt like I was running well but within myself without actually have it, killing myself yeah it was an, an amazing day yeah 20 miles in are you thinking i think i'm gonna do this i think i'm gonna i'm on target for sub three yeah i felt fine i and then just kind of kicked on for the last 10k it was just one of those dream kind of runs really i've even seen the footage of you crossing the line and you're just punching the air <laughs> and i think you even possibly have to check to whether you've stopped your watch but the elation was right i mean people are smiling around you but you being tall as well was just so st standing out in your vest just punching you across the line it must have been a feeling of elation yeah it was an amazing feeling because obviously i wanted to do well because it's a personal achievement and to have that time you know that no one's ever going to take that away from you then you've got that sub free and you can tell everyone for years and i've been dining out on it since then mate you yeah, know yeah. What i mean yeah I'm, i don't think i've had a good race since then but I've still got that story to, to share and it was it was amazing where you get all the training just right and you feel good on race day and yeah just that sense of personal achievement and just yeah it was great I've got to make the most of this opportunity, John, and to have uh, another extrovert sitting across from me to ask you a bit more about it. When I meet someone who is charged up by uh, meeting other people and new people and and doesn't have that sort of social filter of shyness mm. that, that so many people I've met do, I always tell people, I remember when I went to university, I was definitely a bit warped by my experiences. I always thought it was like a 50-50 thing. I was like, some people are like a bit quiet and some people are a bit louder. And what I sort of started to realize is that through my life, I've been going up to people and making the openings. So going up, hello, blah, 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 blah. And then they just kind of have to respond to you. And I'm not reading into that, that actually that might not have happened if I hadn't gone up to them in the first place. And I remember university was quite a significant time where I had this realization that actually, and through a lot of conversations, a lot of people are actually quite introverted, quite shy. In fact, I'd almost go to say the majority of people have a, a level of that. So it's, it's fascinating when I meet someone who has energy and likes to connect with other people. And not that no, those people don't, but there's just this ease with which we don't mind you just see sort of everyone is on the same level. It doesn't matter you've never met them before. Mm. You, they're almost already, I, just, I don't know, it's like they're friend and stranger. It's hard to differentiate. It's just person. My question to you is, like, from your earliest memories, do you think you were just kind of always like that? Is it mm. something over time or that you lent into because you had a, a natural affinity to it? Have you always been someone who just is okay at being in the spotlight? 
Yeah, I think the way you've described it is perfect, actually. Charging off other people, I really like that idea. And the fact that a person is a person. People are just people. Whether you've known them for a while or whether it's a brand new person, it's still a person. So you kind of treat them the same. Obviously, you can feel a bit different around someone you know a bit better and feel a bit more relaxed. But I've always had that kind of thing. I think it was, I just remember like my mum always saying, just talk to people, ask them lots of questions and just like learn from people. So I always had that value from my mum from a young age. Mm. So I kind of I'd say my mum was the first person because I think my mum was quite quiet, but I think she wanted me not to be like uh, her. Oh, good cry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. I don't mind you. I just feel a bit emotional because of my mum. <laughs> I was going to ask, was yeah. she extroverted as well? Uh, but it's mom, interesting to know she was quiet. Yeah, mum was quite introverted, really. Like, whereas I was the extroverted one. I think she wanted to be, me to be more like, uh, not like her, just to go out and uh, ask lots of questions. So. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there was any risk of that seeing you grow up. <laughs> You're probably like, oh, yeah, he's definitely going to be all right. Yeah, um, yeah, she was fine. I remember like going on like church trips because my parents were Catholic and we'd be on the bus and I'd be, I'd be like, just go and talk to people. I'd be talking to every old person on the bus and probably boring the hell out of them, asking 5,000 questions as, yeah. as kind of any kind of outgoing child uh, does, you know. Yeah, I think I've always had that natural affinity with people. I don't know what the opposite of misanthropic is, but I'm the opposite of misanthropic. Um, I, I like people. I like the idea of charging off them, even if I'm, like, tired or... I don't have energy or whatever, going out and like sometimes meeting new people, having those conversations, doing a bit of showing off, um, I just recharge me. Mm. It, it, I once heard this incredible analogy, um, which I totally related to. It's like um, if you have two different types of people, one extroverted, one introverted, they go to a party and they're meeting lots of new people and they have to have lots of conversations. Everyone kind of goes with a small bag of gold coins and the introvert has to kind of spend their coins. And then by the end of it, they feel quite drained and they have like very little left. The extrovert goes and they're almost taking gold coins that they're collecting them, their bags filling up. <laughs> and, and I've had this where um, I've thought about what's the disadvantage of being like this. And for me, the only thing I can think of is that it can situations can almost become overstimulating. Yeah, yeah. And I find now that like a lot of my long runs, for example, are solo and I'll do a lot of stuff. Um, I'm quite happy in my own company. And I think that's really healthy to spend that time in your own company because some of the stuff I do now with jog on meetups and stuff, it's so intense and so many conversations and I get so charged up. It's like the battery's going to explode because it's like too much I'm getting. And I don't know if you've had an experience like that where you have to sort of um, learn to dial things back a bit and just have a moment of John time because you can get it's like the the magpie picking up all the silver things it's like too exciting <laughs> to meet new people have you had any experience with that i think that's a really 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 good way of explaining it harry i have to say like i suppose i think that my battery needs recharging but maybe it's not it's like my battery's too full yeah. i think that's a good way of explaining it um because of my job going out doing test events with hoka and going out to races and obviously being like people know who i am from doing all the stupid stuff i've d done so i do go out into tesco's and have 25 conversations do you know what I mean and like pay my partners like Jesus Christ we spent like half an hour in here and you're just <laughs> chatting to every single person yeah and sometimes yeah and I do use running for that going out and running on the trails just to kind of recharge and stuff but I've never thought about it again this is turning into a very therapeutic conversation so thank you uh I've never thought about it about my battery overcharging mm. and needing the battery to come down I've always thought about it like being drained but maybe it's just too much that's what i've learned and i've sort of found good ways of dealing with it i mean it's almost like a it's not a bad problem to have no no you, no, no, no. Yeah, it's yeah. almost like too excited but there's it i found that having the self-awareness that when i'm doing something where it's really or i go to like a party or something i just meet all these new people and i just come out and i'm almost like almost vibrating with the energy <laughs> from it because it's like so overstimulating <laughs> that then i'll deliberately try and do something quite solo and quite quiet to kind of balance that out a bit and almost just bring that level back down so my battery is just like 90 percent, not 100 10 kind of thing sometimes i forget that mm. like, i've been so busy like at the moment of work college running kind of everything yeah. i think i've kind of blew that battery up like last week what you said but i never thought about it in that way so thank you for explaining that to me i've learned something today so. no, no it's, it's an interesting it's something that's that, a good way of looking at it yeah now. once i'd heard that i just thought oh that's that's really fascinating that's that's uh that's cool it explains why i'm sort of shaking <laughs> as I leave somewhere not through fear but the, just the opposite like, yeah, yeah. I met this person it was great and then I had a really good conversation and then like, maybe I'll go for a run with them and, I'm, oh, and then I had a conversation with them and then uh, they were great and it was brilliant it's exactly <laughs> that oh, gee, I met Barry and Barry's fantastic and like you just you just get so pumped off of it I think this leads us nicely John onto talking about this week um, coming up we have a plan to run a 5k together 
together. We do. In Portsmouth, yeah. south of England, for anyone listening overseas. The goal essentially is for me to try and run a new 5K PB. And hopefully you'll be there alongside me, shouting at me, <laughs> maybe maybe holding a GoPro once in a while, that kind of thing. Yeah. We'll just see how it goes. Um, you have run a 5K PB of 1709. I You've have. almost got close to breaking into those, the infamous 16, uh, late 16 barrier. How are you feeling at the moment with 5K pace? We've talked about maybe setting off at 1740. How is 5K running for you at the moment? Well, we'll have to wait and see. I've been running really well. Like I did the South Downs Way relay recently and I was, feeling, I was only like three weeks ago and felt really fit on that. I haven't been able to probably do as many speed sessions uh, since then, unfortunately. Life has got in the way and I blew my battery up last week, as we talked about. So <laughs> that battery kind of got a bit messy. There was lithium everywhere. <laughs> covered uh, in lithium. Covered in lithium, which stopped me from doing any kind of sessions. But as I said to you earlier, classic runner. Still went out and ran, but couldn't get any sessions in. But... I, I will give it a bloody good go, mate. I'm just looking forward to getting out and running. The Lakeside 5K course is nice and flat. It's a little bit stony, um, but we'll fly around in our Rocket X2s, won't we? And we'll get the job done and try and get you to a, a 1740. I run 1730 once this year, so I feel, I'm, and that was not off much training. So we'll see we'll give it a go right fingers crossed absolutely it'll be it'll be great to be sharing the experience with you i really hope we can we can break it 1751 i did a few weeks ago new 5k pb and now i just feel like you know when you're sort of you're peaking a little bit and you think you kind of want to capitalize on this opportunity so well rested done a little bit of some very small training block and now ready to go again um when i finished that 1751 just for your information uh i did finish thinking there's definitely a little bit more there. You know, when you finish and you know that, oh, I could have probably picked it up a bit sooner or I could have run that kilometer a bit quicker. I wasn't like everything I have complete out effort. It was more like there was a few percent there that could maybe be played with. So I'm, I'm going to be interested to see see what's possible. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it, John. It should be good. I can't wait, mate. I, let's go really hard and uh, like on that first two kilometers. I'm sure I'm sure that's how uh, faster the runners do it. do it. Just go absolutely mental for yeah. 2K and then try and hold on for the next 3K. Yeah, we'll use that next kind of extroverted energy and that leftover lithium um i think they gave lithium to crazy people back in the day didn't they to calm them down makes sense yeah so maybe we'll uh, get some of that um <laughs> from the battery yeah we'll, we'll we'll smash it up you're gonna do great anyway 1750 already like to watch your progress has been amazing mate it's going it's all right. Brilliant, yeah. It's going okay. As we start to wind down this co wonderful conversation, John, it's been fantastic to talk to you. I think I've been wanting to ask you that you've ticked some really big boxes here. You've proven yourself to be a brilliant club runner. You've come first at some pretty serious races. You've done some wonderful things with your running so far. So the question really has to be where from now? You've got the sub three hour marathon. What are you looking at next? Do you want to tackle more ultras? Do you want to go back to that marathon and try and take that PB down? What do you want to do with your running moving forwards? Life's just been so busy with like everything over the last like year year and a half did so well up to 2019 with my running and then lockdown happened and life and my mum died and everything just went a bit crazy in the world I didn't really focus on PBs until again last year when I thought I could start running fast again mm. and so I think for me I'd like to I'd love to get a sub 17 5k a 16.59 one day. That'd be brilliant. Yeah, sub 120 half uh, later in the year. I'll try and try and do that. I've tried that a couple of times. I always seem to be ill or get injured just for a half. Yeah, I'd like to do a fast marathon time. Something 240 something would be good or a low 250. I do like trail running as well. I'm a bit, I'm really into trails and just like running up and down hills. There's something just quite, again therapeutic about it and just yeah you recently i mean you could call it recently it's probably been a little while now but it feels recent you started up with the running shoe company hoka yep. um that must have led to some great opportunities they've uh, it looks like they've capitalized a little bit on john likes meeting people <laughs> and you've been doing some great meetups and stuff and traveling around quite a lot how have you found that job so far that job role you seem to be enjoying it i love it mate i think it's a dream job for me really so when i got the job i couldn't believe it i love running I've run in Hoka shoes for years because I was a Hoka racer before I joined the brand. My favourite thing is doing the running events, you know, going along to a running store or going to a community, bringing shoes, getting people to try shoes on, taking them for a run. Yeah, I just really buzz from that. And if people like the shoes as well, that's a total winner. But it's just about putting myself out there and the brand out there. So people go home remembering that they've had a good night. And it's the perfect job for me. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to have it. That's amazing. John, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I wish you all the best with your running, and I'm really looking forward to our 5K attempt. We're going to rip it up, Harry. Awesome. If you enjoyed this conversation, you can give other episodes a listen. You can also visit thisisjogon.com to check out our running kit, training plans, and discover much more about the world of Jogon. I'm Harry Morgan. Go for that run. And this is Jogon.